Hello and welcome to another episode of Between the Bytes, weekly discussions on IT, cybersecurity, and business. My name is Gary Arnold. And I'm Derek Parkinson. We are joined by a special guest today, Jim Christensen. Jim, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome. Jim, you are the CEO and owner at Lockbox, is that correct? Correct. Tell us a little bit about your role and a little bit about Lockbox. Well, yeah. First of all, thanks for thanks for having me on. The cybersecurity industry right now is very interesting. Uh, Lockbox is a uh, kind of grown out of a company called Callware Technologies. <clears throat> Callware Technologies is a voicemail software. And we've spent the last 18 years delivering a secure voicemail to the Department of Defense. And that's kind of where we have cut our security teeth. And we started with them back before it was even called cybersecurity. And their biggest concern was, can the system be hacked? It came out of, unfortunately, 9-11. They realized that a lot of the systems uh, that they had were vulnerable and they legislatively mandated in the DOD that everything that touched their backbone, their infrastructure had to be certified. And voicemail got thrown into it, and we just happened to be nimble and, I guess, dumb enough to get involved with a really difficult customer. But we were able to adjust and meet the needs strictly from a cybersecurity level back then. And we've kept our product on the what they call their APL, their approved product list. And it's been certified over and over again as OSs you know, go through their life cycle. And we've installed that system around the world at 175 plus DOD installations, ranging anywhere from a Hill Air Force Base, you know, supporting 30, 35,000 users to a Twilly Ar Army Depot that supports 50. So we're supporting a, a Navy wide initiative to regionalize their bases that will support up to 150, 200,000 users on the same system. So from that just little perspective, it's kind of a cool little story that you have this company in Utah that met the need of one of the largest customers in the world and doing it all against the likes of Nortel, Cisco, and Avaya. So from that, just that little standpoint, it's kind of a cool little experience and cool little story. But what we learned out of that, especially the last five or six years, is the government and the DOD are more concerned about our live communication. So our voice video texting conferencing, that's where they feel like we are most vulnerable. If you guys just think about how our communication infrastructure started in the first place, our what they call the PSTN, the public service telephone network, basically started with you know an operator in the middle wearing headphones like Derek does and plugging and connecting people, and in the process, listening to all of it. And so you've always had that man in, man in the middle issue. That system is pretty much, it's improved, but there's still a lot of holes. The government obviously knows that. The cell phone towers, easily hackable. SMS texting, wide open. I think we all experienced in COVID, uh, somebody dropping on to a Zoom call. So there's some serious vulnerabilities that they were concerned about. They put forth what they call a UCR, a Unified Capabilities Requirement Document, and they talked about these issues. And then the, the second part of the issue they brought up that's really important to them is as we've transformed to this digital world, it's leaving a digital imprint everywhere we look. And they're concerned about where that data, that communication digital data ends up. And in a lot of cases, it's ending up in ultimately for a lot of these mediums, these communication mediums to do business, they have to agree to terms of certain state actors in order to be able to access their markets. And so a lot of times our data is ending up in places it's probably not in our best interest. So from a DOD perspective, they were really concerned about that. And so when we put together this idea of lockbox, it's securing that channel, that communication channel, whether it be voice, video, texting, or conferencing. But more importantly, it's taking the encryption keys and we deliver them back to the organization or to the business. So 
in reality for the first time ever, the originator of that content actually owns and controls it. And that's somewhat unique. Well, it's actually very unique in the communication space. So, so that's what we so do. So Jim, does the, does the lockbox product then, and we're going to go on all kinds of tangents and that's my specialty is tangents. Sure. So bear with me, but does the lockbox product then just couple onto whatever video phone or whatever system you're using? So, if, you know, we're using teams, you know, for example, would it just be overlaid on top of teams to keep the data extra secure? That's a great question. And the answer is no, we've built a separate application that's outside of these different mediums. And that's how, number one, it's all on the data channel. So it's going down the data channel versus the telecom channel. That's how you can secure it. We utilize a product called WebRTC. It's a fairly well-known standard of being able to basically bring two parties together for communications. And, and so you can add all the encryption layers, but again, most of these communication mediums, I gotta be careful what I say, the, the communication is awesome. I mean, our ability to do this right now is really cool. Uh, my ability to text a friend last night in Japan and have that instant communication is really cool if you think about it. But what it's done is it's lowered our cybersecurity hygiene, what I like to call our Cygene. It's made us lazy. It's made us lackadaisical in what we text, what we say, because all of those mediums whether it's their main purpose or just a really important side purpose, they're collecting the data and they're either flat out profiting from it by selling and marketing to it, or they're using it for, you know, really targeted advertising, or they're taking it and trying to improve their product, hopefully. But ultimately that data really belongs to them. And so we built this product platform application separate from that. And that's how we can give that control back to the real owner of it. Because we're, we don't have access. Once we, once we set up that private encrypted key server for that company or that organization, that family even, we don't have access to it. So none of our employees, like all of Microsoft's employees, all of Google's employees, all of Facebook's employees, some form or fashion can probably get their hands in on that data and you get a disgruntled employee or you get the bigger companies are bigger targets. The concern we have of trying to bring this product to the general business sector is that now in ransomware, everybody's a target. It's ransomware as a service. They can stick their stuff out. And, and uh, I, I think the one thing that the war in Ukraine and Russia exposed is this idea that they're full blown companies that are doing nothing but hacking. They've, they've got, got HR departments. They've got <laughs> HR departments. They've got, they've got quotas to meet, you know, it's a little alarming. And I think I, I read a report, I think it came out from Lumen talking about what they're seeing. 94% of the attacks that they're seeing are on small businesses. So yep. we're trying to figure out our way to, to bring this kind of this military grade security mentality, a product built with a uh, security mentality first, rather than just convenience and bells and whistles and strictly nothing more than a user experience first. So that's kind of what, what Lockbox is all about. And is and this a requirement or do you see it becoming a requirement soon for third party contractors? For the government, the acronym is escaping me, but there is a yeah CMMC is is what you're That's talking the about, Eric. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Two point is right now. It was supposed to be released in January, I think, and it's mired in the government world of trying to figure out how to implement something. If they were to implement it as it stands right now, it would probably shut down the entire supply chain for the government. <laughs> yeah. So, I could so imagine. They're, <laughs> they're trying to figure out a way to either scale it in, ramp it in, score it accordingly and let and let companies come up to speed. But one of the things that we are hearing is that communications very well could be a part of that or a more important part of that. I think that's the interesting thing. I've I've been 
you know, the DOD space that we've been in, I haven't had to travel at all. I've sent my guys out to install all over the world, but I've, you just don't sell and market to them. Your product's certified, you're good. You're going to sit and answer an RFP and then wait and then wait and then wait. And eventually it'll happen to that point. Kind of funny that we just installed a, a site, Quantico, back in Virginia. We've been working off and on on that site for five years. <laughs> and we finally got it awarded to us in September, right at the end of the fiscal year last year. And they issued a PO and they're like, okay, I'm like, great. When, when do you want to do it? We'll, we'll get everything ordered. And they're like, oh, well, that's, you know, January, February, or March, some, somewhere along that line. You're just like, you guys, <laughs> your speed of business <laughs> is just not the same. So we, we finally just installed that at, back in, at Quantico, which was kind of cool. But it, and it just, you must be a patient guy for picking the industry you've worked in. <laughs> it's, it's been a little difficult of a road to, you can't forecast, it's hard to plan, but it's fairly steady in terms of business. But to that point, Derek, yeah, the CMMC is critical. And as I was saying, as the last six months, I've, as we're trying to launch this commercial product, I've had to go out and travel. I'm in front of people, I'm on podcasts, I'm speaking at conferences, or I'm just there attending and listening to what everything is being said. And they've got the cybersecurity world has done a great job with coming up with great tools and a great toolkit for all the businesses out there. But the one kind of what I would refer to as the tip of the spear, one of the missing pieces of the pie is nobody talks about securing the actual communication. And that communication is critical because they say 80 plus percent of hacking begins at the credential level. And if you think about where, where our credentials being passed around, unfortunately, a lot of them are poor hygiene and they're being passed around on our texting and an open platform like email sometimes, or, you know, just on a phone call. If you're, if you're a bigger target, then that's gotta be concerned. So, we feel like we're fitting into a nice little gap that's not being discussed. And so, yes, it comes to the supply chain risk from the government, just, but to every one of us, the hackers will try to get to the biggest target. They may start pretty low on, on, on the totem pole and kind of work their way up. So. Yeah, we definitely have a history of the things that have been around for the longest or are overly ingrained into our day to day. We kind of, a little bit blind to it. Same with the different industries, Colonial Pipeline or back in the UK, the Royal Mail. Three years ago, four years ago, none of us would ever even consider that that could be something that could be attacked yeah. or could be an issue. Jim, I'm curious, obviously this this type of communication encryption and, and the requirement behind it is, is, is happening with the DOD and the federal level. What about other government entities uh, that are maybe on the local or more smaller scale? You know, we work, for example, with a lot of cities and towns um, mm -hmm. that have their own set of, of requirements and things. Do you feel like, you know, this type of requirement is going to be coming down their way as well? We've talked to a, a couple people locally. Uh, we met with the mayor of Riverton. We've talked to some state people. They get a little glossy eyed, to be honest, of trying to figure out how to implement it. Our biggest challenge is what we're up against is what Derek was saying is we get so accustomed to using one platform. We've had our IT guys come to us and say, hey, this is this is secure. This is the direction we need to go. It's most cost effective, whatever it might be. To be able to go and have to go back to them and uh, to their bosses and say, uh, yeah, we've got a security issue. Uh, we need to, We need to move to this new platform. I think we're getting a little bit of pushback on that because of the, the friction. What you're doing with Lockbox is, is you're building a closed loop network. So you're inviting in to your organization only those people that need to be into that conversation. So they get you're sending them an invite. So the assumption is that you know them. So whether it's internally or a customer or a client, they have to accept the invite, register, do the complicated password, set up MFA, all that good stuff. But then their device has to be verified. And the device has to be verified each time the communication takes place before any encryption or decryption takes place. 
and that's that's got friction written all over it. And so for the, the ease of use that we're all used to, that flies in the face of reason. But the bottom line is it's, it's, it's actually friction on purpose. And we kind of learned that with the DOD in the sense that they would require, you know, a 30 day password reset or a longer than a four digit passcode to get into their voicemail. And we got all kinds of pushback. Our guys would go out there on site and install and all, all the administrators like how, how turn this off. This is driving me crazy. And we're just like, Hey, we're just meeting the security certifications that people up above you have set. You want to turn them off. That's on you. We're not going to do it for you. But in the same principle applies to just uh, general people, whether it's small government, big government or businesses, the only way we're going to improve any of our cybersecurity protocols or standards is there's going to be some friction. It's going to take some effort. And if it means you have to log in and you, you know, you're going to have a sensitive conversation, you know, you're going to text something sensitive. Okay. Well now you go and use this. You don't text it right during the middle of a, a team's chat or a meetings chat. You have to think about things now. And, and I think that's, that's the friction. Setting up an organization is not that big a deal. You have to do the same thing in teams. It's just getting people to change their behavior. With these uh, iterations and improvements that you talked about, Jim, especially at the beginning as, as things have evolved over the past, you know, 20 plus years, I'm curious, how often is it the partners, vendors like, like you guys that are go coming to the DOD and saying, look, we're noticing this you should start thinking about it. Or is it more the other way around? The DOD is saying, hey, we want this. We need this. Please make it happen. Where are the trends coming from, I guess? I think we've seen most of those on what we saw is coming from them. They've got large exposure, obviously. And, and if you think about the government and the DOD, they're getting attacked constantly. And from their perspective, they're at DEF CON 1 and have been for quite a while in terms of a communication standpoint. They're getting attacked for information. The rest of us, we're just getting a simple shakedown for money. They're constantly aware of it. They're constantly trying to improve their protocols and standards. I think a lot of what we see from them are, you'll see the vulnerabilities hit the commercial sector, whether it's a Microsoft patch or whatever. And, and that will quickly trickle down to them and then trickle down to all of their suppliers like us where we've got to meet that standard or, or figure out if there's a remediation that needs to take place on a, a certain protocol. But generally, because of the way we do business with them, that's pushed down from them. Now, they'll have industry, industry experts come together and talk about what they're seeing. That's kind of when we started talking to them four or five years ago about what they're seeing in, in specifically in the live communication space. And then they'll slowly put together a, a document that lists all the requirements they're hoping to see, and then hope that somebody will be bold enough to go out and do something about it. So the government space is, is a little crazy when it comes to that. Everybody's trying, trying to just not upset the apple cart and get their piece of the pie. And the big boys are just constantly fighting to try to keep their share. And then the smaller companies like us that are really meeting, I think it's really cool that we meet the needs of the government in such a unique way because we're agnostic to the switch. So we can go, we went to Hill Air Force Base and delivered a, a voicemail where you have a Cisco in one building, you have an old Nortel in another building, and you've got a new Avaya system being turned up somewhere else. We can go and deliver that. We deliver to them one voicemail system. So we feel like we really helped the government answer a lot of different questions. It's a long rambling answer, but it's what we've experienced is generally coming from their direction to us. And, and we've kind of reversed this with lockbox is we saw a need. Now we're meeting it. And now we're definitely sensing it in the commercial space that there is a gap for sure. You've uh, alluded to this a little bit that at the end of the day, it's all about end users. And we've, we've, you know, had these conversations on the podcast before about you're only as strong as, as an individual user and one mistake on, on their end can, you know, upend whatever systems you've put in place. 
So I was curious, what are some personal or individual cybersecurity best practices, maybe even that you implement yourself uh, to ensure your, that you can stay secure as an individual? Well, Gary, that's a great point. We generally think that the most important people are having the most important conversations and, and are passing the most important information around. And we all know that it very well could be the employee that's, you know, maybe dealing with inventory or dealing with accounts payable, the hourly employee that may or may not care other than just getting a paycheck, unfortunately. I think what, I, what I've been seeing and listening to and learning is, it, is that's why all of these cybersecurity tools are important. It's just not, okay, we're not going to be the, the, the one thing that will solve all your cybersecurity problems if you start communicating better. Well, that's why endpoint detection, that's why monitoring, that's why good backup and recovery is important and making sure they're clean and, and you actually can restore them and that you're actually implementing all of these tools according to the way they're supposed to be implemented. I keep hearing a lot of these conferences that a lot of these breaches will occur because they just didn't deploy the systems correctly. So for us, you know, personally and internally, we use Lockbox kind of like our Slack channel, like Slack. All of our communications take place within Lockbox. We know it's secure. When my wife or even, even uh, my executive assistant texts me and say, hey, what credit card should I use? It's like, would you ever text that? Well, I think in the past we may have out of convenience. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, they can take a picture of a card. I can take a picture of a card and send it to them. I can give them the number. Uh, I can give my kids their social security number as a, when they forget and, and be totally 100% confident that I've got the keys. I own that data. It's not going anywhere else. And we've seen that they're trying to get, they're kind of moving in that direction. If you look at WhatsApp's latest advertisement, if you guys have seen the, the carrier pigeon, have you guys seen that one? It's like you're going into a, it looks like a UPS store. You're going to go mail something and say, yeah, I need to send this message. And the guy puts the little message in the back of a carrier pigeon and they're like, wait a second, that's, that's not secure. And he's like, well, yeah, you're texting is not secure. SMS texting is that's it's just like what you're doing. And so, yeah, what's happening? You know, we're encrypting your messages now. And I was like, great. Finally. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but then I asked the question, would, would any of you stand your social security on WhatsApp? No. For those on the podcast, they're both shaking their head. No. Not a chance. <laughs> no. Why? <laughs> Who owns the encryption keys? Right. It's not me. And it's not yeah. even a, it's not even a, an American company. Not that it being American or not really matters at the end of the day, but it's not me. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So all those listening to this podcast, don't text sensitive information on WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, Jim, is, is the implication also you texting that, that tracks, should I also be as cautious with any kind of phone call? I think we generally recognize that most of us are not national security risks. And maybe I would probably guess 80% of our communications probably are not sensitive in nature, but it's just, it's that, that convenience that have led us to the lackadaisical, what we like to call here, our willful oblivion. We're willfully oblivious to this idea that nobody's going to care. The compute power that's out there now and combination of that and the bad actors coming into play, they've got the time to sit there and build social profiles on us, on our social media and on our texting. And if you are someone of, of importance within your own company, you're most likely going to be some sort of target. So should you, I would say if you're, if you know, you're having a, a sensitive, you're going to talk about something sensitive. Yeah. You probably should start to become more aware of it. I think that concept of the bad actors not caring it can be a double-edged sword because it is true. They don't care, you know, specifically you, Jim, you personally, yeah. they're not figuring out where you live and all of your worst fears before they try and uh, wait for you to send a credit card number through a regular text message. 
But if they pull a few thousand text messages and you just so happen to be the one who has texted a credit card number, then yeah, they care in that sense that they're going to go ahead and take that. It's not personal, but it doesn't mean that you can be necessarily ignored. It doesn't take them knowing who you are personally and trying to personally attack you to be able to pull information. It's a computer that can scrub stuff. These days, the speed in which they can scrub things is honestly a little bit daunting and kind of terrifying on how fast some of these computers and programs can run. So yeah, yeah they, they don't care, but that doesn't mean that just because you're an individual doesn't mean that you're, you're immune to any of this. And therein lies the, the challenge for an IT department is how do we get all of our employees on board and think in that same way? Yep. Yeah, you would think that we could learn a little faster, but I mean, you look at T-Mobile, Uber, T-Mobile again, <laughs> Twitter, T-Mobile again, and then T-Mobile again and T-Mobile again. None of those bit major attacks were from the CEO or any of the C-suite for that matter. It was just an employee yep. every single time. Yep. You know, I, I want to take us on a quick tangent because some of the things you've said have, have reminded me of this very current event headline. What's your take on uh, banning TikTok? Uh, it's about time. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, you don't want to sound obviously xenophobic, but the CCP and, and the way things are run over there is alarming. We spent some time recently with the former... CISO of the DOD, and she was she's a high enough level that, where she was a political appointee, so she's now former with the transition of administrations. Her point is that politics didn't matter. They don't care about politics. It doesn't matter who's running the administration necessarily. They, they're targeting and they're collecting data as quickly as they can. And as I mentioned, some of these companies, in order to have access to that market, they have to agree the terms of the CCP and TikTok's nothing but a, a data collection service <laughs> from a real cynical level. And, and quite honestly, a lot of, lot of our mediums that, that we're all using are in some sense doing the same thing. They're collecting data on us. They're collecting our location, our movements, our texting behavior. I mean, yeah, it is alarming in, in a lot of ways that when I wake up in the morning, I get in my car and the first thing it it shows me on my maps is how many minutes to Rich's Bagels. I'm just like, how did you know that that's where I go on Monday morning? <laughs> <laughs> but not Tuesday. <laughs> I think one of my, my favorite movement tracking stories in the past few years, it's unfortunately it's, it's actually quite scary, but um, Strava or the walking or running app that tracks yeah, Strava. miles and everything. Strava. Yeah. Are you well, going to make me delete the app after the story? Is that? Well, no, it was our military bases and our embassies. Oh, yeah. Their security patrols would have Strava running or not, not even actively running, but it would be tracking their locations. And if you look at it on a map, it'll show like a little line that's almost a heat map of where you're walking. So we found out one day that, oh, my gosh, you can see where all of our security guards go, how long it takes them what their intervals are around each of our embassies and a, a bunch of our bases throughout the world because we had our location services on. So if you were trying to break in, which again, that's, that's pretty risky as, as it is, but still that's a pretty big piece of information for you. As Strava yeah. says, you know, here, whoever wants to view it because it's a social media platform as well. It is very public. The security here guards are just the, trying to get their miles in. Yeah. Here is how long it takes them. Here's how frequent it is. Here's the exact route they take every single time. There's just little things. And again, it's, it's so common to us, location services. There's plenty of times that I've hit yes without thinking about it just because I want to make the notification go away. It's just a massive, another massive blind spot because it's so common now. Yeah. You know, this Katie Arrington, like I mentioned, the former CISO of the DOD told us some stories that were similar along those lines in terms of like Bluetooth. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm in a high level sec def meeting and one of the top generals is in there. He's got a, you know, Bluetooth hearing aid. She's like, general, you got to take that out. I can't come in this, this skiff. He's like, what are you talking about? 
He's like, no, that's a serious vulnerability. I had one of my uh, Luke is one said, of the most insecure communication protocols ever, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I, one of my guys, they were installing somewhere. I don't know where it was. It wasn't a skiff, but it was inside their enclave. And they all of a sudden, three really serious guys walk in, and they're like, "Hey, who's got a Bluetooth mouse? Who's this so and so person?" And all of a sudden, my guy is just like, uh, "That's me." You know, and next thing you know, he's taking his his mouse, he's taking his watch out of this room. So Bluetooth is, again, one of those vulnerabilities or one of those blind spots that we're so accustomed to using. The other story she told was they were on a Teams meeting inside the Pentagon and towards some portion of the meeting, all of a sudden they heard some a different language of somebody speaking in the background. <laughs> And she just like, everybody freaked out. And they're like, oh my gosh, shut it down. And they, they hurry and shut it down. They're like, okay, well, let's just turn up a new, just turn up a new session. And she was like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> we just, there's a serious breach. We've got to come to the, get to the bottom of. So those are kind of some of the stories she's, she, she was telling me about. And she's just like, you know. You hate to play in in the FUD world, but it's real. There's a lot of uncertainty and, and things going on that, that we're just kind of oblivious to. So, Well, Jim, this has been incredibly insightful and really interesting and a glimpse of the other side of the world that most people, I think, don't uh, forget exists. You know, the DOD, we, we've all heard, we know the acronym, but man, there's a whole thing going on over there. So interesting. We appreciate the glimpse in there. I wanted to pivot a little bit on the last portion of the podcast and and talk a little more about, in general, your business and, you know, over the years, your your individual leadership or management approach, you know, and building a culture. I imagine you guys were probably a bit more remote even before the pandemic. Is that is that somewhat accurate or at least hybrid? So, so tell us a little bit about the company structure, how you've built it, and how you've built a company culture. Yeah, so I've got a unique, somewhat unique background in, in today's world. I graduated in finance, in, in accounting, and started at Callware Technologies back in 1995, and I'm still here. That doesn't happen very often anymore. <laughs> no. Back then late nineties, we were on a good path of going public. Uh, we'd gone through all the different rounds of raising VC money and got a huge deal with a company called Alcatel out of France. We were going to be their computer telephony piece, their voicemail unified messaging piece in with a new switch. 1999 hit. I don't know if either of you guys remember that, but that's the internet bubble bursting, the dot-com upheaval. At the same time, the telecom industry kind of got kicked in the chops and that affected us. So I went from a company of like 160, uh, all of a sudden, almost overnight, we're down to 30. The VCs kind of pulled their funding and this whole big project that we were doing with Alcatel that was going to be our next round of, of funding and growth just evaporated. And so we just kind of, I guess from that standpoint, the C-suites kind of all left and I knew where all the bodies were buried being the controller at the time and just kind of started to pick up the pieces and, and see if we could cobble together a plan. And unfortunately, 9-11 happened. And out of that, we had this opportunity come up that we adjusted and, and went after and took some risks to try to capitalize on that opportunity. And and it's been a really interesting journey since then, just in the sense that we've, we're delivering this basically enterprise level, enterprise size product to a customer. We've been just ready to grow, ready to expand, and it just hasn't required us to. So I've tried to build a culture of loyalty so that when I have to send my guys out to remote parts of the world, that they know they can come back and take a little bit of time off. I know when I when we go through this certification process every three years, it basically requires somebody to be on site in really some glorious destinations. One of them is called Fort Huachuca. It's a couple hours south of Tucson in the middle of nowhere. 
not glorious at all, <laughs> nothing to do. So they're either down there for four to six weeks or they're back in Virginia at Norfolk testing center back there. So that's not as bad, but it still means they're away from their families for extended periods of time. So we've just had to really focus on building a cultural of appreciation and loyalty in a space where the valley here is growing technology wise. There's demands on our our engineers constantly being recruited away. The one thing that has been very attractive for them is they're not stuck in a box. They're not stuck on just one little piece of a project. A lot of our senior senior engineers have been able to just expand their creativity and be involved in a lot of bigger processes of the engineering development process. So that's that's been important for us and tried to foster that. We've mostly been on site when when COVID hit. We had space here that that was conducive enough to be able to still come to work and be fine. Had a couple engineers that felt a little uh, more comfortable about going home. And it's it's actually turned out okay. I, I, was, I was a little reticent at first. I feel like the remote stuff, you suffer on your collaboration. You have to be much more diligent about reaching out to somebody when they're right next door to you or a cube over here when you have to like call them up or whatever it it takes it takes a little more intention to to have that collaboration work effectively but we've had to be flexible with our engineers and then the other thing that's happened is the remote work i'm pretty sure i had one employee that probably had another job at the same time being in the big brother world you don't want to be big brother so you you kind of have to have some trust you have to build some trust with your employees. And, and that's another important aspect of what we've tried to do is trust them and hope. And, and yeah, we had one leave, and but we picked up somebody else that's picked up the pieces. And two months into the job, he just picked up and moved to Tennessee. Just like, oh. And I, and I found out like a month and a half later. I'm looking at my CTO. I'm like, uh, you realize I've got some fiduciary responsibilities involved when somebody moves from state to state? You the whole thing, yeah. You kind of need to make me aware of those things, but that's mm -hmm. what that's what the environment is now. Is all of a sudden, he just like picked up and moved, and didn't really bother to tell us. So it has provided some unique challenges for sure. Yeah, but here I am now, twenty eight years later. I've been running the company since about two thousand four, and we've pivoted from this voicemail centric business to now. We still have. We still have that product. We're still delivering that to the DOD, but we've had we have this new commercial product that's exciting and has changed just my life in the last six months in terms of how many cities I've seen. And it's always a challenge to go through daylight savings like we just did. Now do daylight savings <laughs> and be in, in a couple different time zones during the same week after that. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so Jim, again, we, we really appreciate the insights, the insider knowledge. Any uh, any closing thoughts that you would share, whether it's, you know, additional leadership ideas or thoughts or just, you know, some cybersecurity takeaways for business leaders? Well, I was, I was at a conference this morning and the speaker, his name is Sean Moon. He's the CEO of, of Zero Res. Great guy, great speaker. One of his messages was about trust and how you build trust with for his instance was uh, with his franchisees, but it really comes down to building trust with your employees, building trust with your customers. I, th I think that's important. And uh, to, to be vulnerable enough to learn and to grow is important. Uh, we're doing that at Lockbox as we, the product's relatively new. And so as we push it out to people, we're trying to be vulnerable and listen to their feedback and, and, try to give them the best experience possible as we still pay attention to the security. I think trust is an important thing. Loyalty is important. And I think overall, if I were to leave everybody with just a closing message is we just need to be more aware, unfortunately. That's what the world is devolving into is technology is awesome, but it also presents a lot of that convenience, presents a lot of challenges that people will exploit. And 
So just become much more cognizant and aware. Remove the the willful oblivion from your lives and, and try to figure out a way to do it better. The most secure form of communication is face-to-face. COVID did a lot of damage. And one of those things was our face-to-face experiences. It did make possible for things like this. Being able to do a podcast is great and, and be able to get that out to many many additional ears and eyes is is important but yeah that face to face communication is always critical for relationships so Love excellent it. um thank you jim appreciate those closing thoughts as we wrap up here the last thing if people want to reach out or find you where can they find you they can go to our website www.lockbox.app and it's l o c h b o x You'll see our logo is around those lines of the Loch Ness Monster. Nessie is surrounding the chat bubble and securing this, the, that mystery <laughs> monster is securing our uh, your chat bubble. So that's where you can find us. You can reach out to me personally on LinkedIn. Yeah, that's probably the best, easiest way. So Awesome. Really awesome. appreciate this, this time with both of you. Yeah, yeah Jim, this has been great. We appreciate it. Um, and to our listeners, thank you for listening and or watching. And uh, that's it for this week. We will catch you next time. See ya.